a wonderful evening to the wonderful audience. I, Neha Thavrani, hereby welcome you to the session of OCLF 2020. Our respected guest for today is Mr. Rajdeep Sardesai. Rajdeep Sardesai is a senior journalist and author of the best-selling book, 2014, The Election That Changed India. He began his career with the Times of India and was the city editor of its Mumbai edition at the age of 26. He began his career with the Times of India and was the city editor at he was also known, uh, he, was, he has also won the Asian Television Awards 2014 for Best News Presenter in Asia for the coverage of the 2014 general elections. He has also won the Asian Television Awards 2014 for Best News Presenter in, in Asia for the coverage of the 2014 general elections. He has been news anchor for the year of the year at the Indian Television Academy for eight of the last 10 years. And this program, Big Fight won the Asian TV Award for the best talk show twice in a row. The achievements are never ending. Today, Mr. Sardesai will talk about how elections are won and lost in India in conversation with Sunaina Kumar. Sunaina Kumar is an independent journalist based in Delhi. She writes on social justice and gender, among other topics. Her work has been published in Guardian, BBC, AI Zira, uh, Dell Spiegel, and various publications. She is a fellow with the Robert Bosch Foundation, the European Journalism Center, and the DART Center at Columbia University. We are pleased to hear. He, we are pleased to hear you both. Screen is all yours. Over to you. Thank you, Neha, for that introduction. And good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us on this Saturday evening. And uh, thank you also to the Orange City Literature Festival, which has brought us together at this time to talk about books and to talk about reading and ideas and discussions at a time like this, when it really does feel like an antidote to the pandemic. My name is Sunaina, and I am really excited to be here this evening with our guest, Rajdeep Sardesai, whom we're all very familiar with. But perhaps the side of him that we're less familiar with is that of an author. And um, the books that we will primarily be talking about today are uh, The Election That Changed India, which tracked the 2014 election and how Modi won India, which came out earlier this year, which tracked the 2019 election. And I have read both and I highly recommend them, not just for a ground level analysis of what happened during those elections, but also for mapping the larger political trends in India and also for a very objective and incisive account of, um, of political trends, of how the Indian electorate is changing in India as the country changes. Thank you very much, Rajdeep, for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, since this is a literature festival, I have a lot of questions on politics, of course, which we will shortly sure. get into. But the first question that I must ask you is actually about writing. As someone who has the sort of dynamic job that you do, always on the move, always meeting people on the field, in studios, how is the process of writing a book for you challenging and rewarding? Can you tell us a little about that? Thank you very much, uh, Sunaina. And uh, uh, thank you earlier, Neha, for that kind introduction. And thank you to all uh, uh, those here at the Orange City Literature Festival. Uh, yes, uh, you know, writing for me is almost therapeutic. It's like uh, it provides a sense of healing. Uh, because, uh, you know, television news is a mad place. It's a 24 by 7 uh, crazy place where today's news is the next hour's history. You may not even remember what happens uh, uh, the next uh, hour, uh, you know, a story which is broken, uh, let's say, at the moment. On the other hand, a book lasts, a book endures. And I think somewhere the writing bug in me, I started off as a print journalist. I only 
sort of strayed into television. My original interests were in a newspaper. You know, I still, if you ask me, what is it about the media that excites you the most? It's the front page of a newspaper. I love holding a newspaper in my hand in the morning. So I've always sort of seen myself almost as a self-image as someone who came from the newspaper generation. I also believe in a strange way that, uh, uh, you know, things happen at the right time at the right place. In 2014, uh, I had just quit CNN IBN for the first time in my professional life after 25 years. I just didn't have a full time job. So I got those four months to sit down and write about an election about someone whom I had tracked for years, i.e. Narendra Modi. You know, I in 1990 met Mr. Modi for the first time. I was a 25 year old young journalist and I was covering the Rath Yatra of LK Advani. So in a sense, Narendra Modi's career almost paralleled mine. I mean, I stayed where I am. He went on to become the prime minister of the country. Uh, and then when the 2019 book happened, I have to give credit to my wife, Sagrika, because she said, you must write a sequel. You know, the first 2014 book was about, uh, you know, this complete dramatic transformation, the downfall of the Congress and the rise of Modi. 2019 was perhaps an even tougher election because when you're in power, to get re-elected is sometimes much more difficult than when you're in the opposition and you're simply targeting the government. So I said, okay, uh, let me make the effort. And I I must confess, I don't know how I did it, but I spent three, four hours every morning waking up at six in the morning and writing till about 10 a.m. and trying to keep the noise of the news away from me. Because I think tell, uh, writing does that. Writing enables you to keep the noise away. And a final point, I think when you write a book like, let's say, this 2019 book that's now out in paperback, uh, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, if people want to know what, how did Mr. Modi achieve what he did, these two massive majorities, maybe they'll have an opportunity. I didn't have that opportunity when I was growing up. I was obsessed with politics and I didn't get to read a book, let's say, on how Indira Gandhi lost. There was one book, All the Prime Ministers Men by Janardhan Thakur, but nothing else. Now, in America, they write 30, 40, 50 books after every election. In India, we don't. And I do hope that more and more people write because I think as journalists, we have a ringside view to what's happening. And if we can share that in a manner and make it accessible to people, maybe 10, 20 years from now, if not today, I want people to understand what's happening. Television doesn't help understanding. Television doesn't add to your comprehension. A book does. I think that's the difference between a book and a television show. Television show is here and now. It's it's about the noise of news. A book gives you the chance to reflect, to introspect, to understand what is happening. And that's what I've tried to do with both these books. On And in between, I wrote a book on cricket, but cricket is my passion. So that <laughs> is something else. Right. And I have to add to that, um, the point that you're making about record keeping. Uh, I came to the 2014 book later. Uh, and I read yeah. the 2019 yeah. book first. And for me, it was really interesting uh, because I see them really, as you said, it's almost a sequel. They're companion books because the, um, you know, it, it builds up, it tracks the changes. All that is really fascinating. I have to ask you, what is it about the Indian election that fascinates you so much? You know, I'm just fascinated by India. You know, the, which other country, this is the craziest but also the best country in the world. I keep telling my friends who are in England, I say, you know, if you are going to report, you often report only on the weather. You know, uh, life in India is ever changing. And I think an election brings out all the color and the festivities, as well as the as the power of the Aam Admi, in a strange way. It's not as if their lives are going to change. The Bihar election is not going to change the life of the Bihari migrant labor. Uh, but people get a sense that if I vote, or if I'm part of the process in some way, maybe, maybe, you know, I can make a small difference. And I think that is remarkable. You know, when people, you see people, uh, there's an election going on today as we speak in the snows of Jammu and Kashmir. I mean, it's snowed out, but people are going out there in very difficult conditions uh, with the threat of the gun, but campaigning, people are voting. So I think, I think it shows the energy of this country. You know, India is the most energetic country in the world. Whatever else we are, we may be, we are the ma most maddening, but also the most energetic country. So I think an election brings out all that energy. You know, who else but in India, 48 degrees temperature, middle of the afternoon, 
people will wait for hours for mamta banerjee to come she will speak for 5 minutes then they'll see the udan khatola the helicopter taking off everybody chasing it waving i mean you know where else in the world but in india will you get these images it's the best country in the world for an election there's nothing like an indian election it's a true festival i agree with you uh we must get to your uh, last book uh, the newest one and sure. uh, in that um, you offer a lot of interesting behind the scenes details and also analysis on how the election was won and um, the way you structured it is also seems to be through the through the three m's actually more than three m's yeah, but uh, maybe for this discussion we can stick to the main three m's uh, sure. which is money media and the election machinery of um, of the winning party in this case and the modi fourth oh, of course the most important m in this case <laughs> so can you tell us a little about that and and what did you discover about about these you know what has happened sunena over the years i think is that uh the these m's money media machine and modi except for mr modi the other three m's also existed in some form or the other 34 40 years ago in fact 30 years ago there was another m muscle uh you know the you know i i i saw an election in 1919 in mumbai in the heart of mumbai where one group and the other was stuffing ballot boxes in front of me you know and we uh, we this was pre television we took some photographs and we actually uh, got a complaint before the election commission and the uh, election was uh, countermanded so i think money always existed in indian politics but the scale of it is now out of control the amount of money that people put into elections it's not into posters and hoardings anymore it's into actually buying votes at times and just controlling the entire election machine the machine in itself is much more sophisticated today and i think one of the things i've tried to bring out in the book is that's what the bjp has achieved you know even whatsapp groups that are set up or call centers that are ringing up people individually the micro management of an election today where you know the exact booth where which uh, voter has voted which way in the last 4 or 5 elections i mean that level of micro management and this machine that has been created is quite remarkable and then we look at the fact of media and that to my mind is the big transition the media's role at election time and the manner in which the media today plays a role in shaping the narrative and when i mean media i just don't mean a television screen i mean social media you know look at whatsapp today one of the most powerful weapons to spread news sometimes what you call fake news in real time is whatsapp people are uh, for example bengal is going to go to the polls in 4 or 5 months there are about 75000 booths in bengal the bjp already has about 75000 whatsapp groups one whatsapp group for every booth connecting people spreading information all in real time and i don't think we realize the importance of this whatsappification of news there are about 400 million whatsapp accounts in india 300 million facebook accounts 200 million twitter accounts then you have share chat uh, with about 170 million all of these have created a kind of multimedia engine where you can control the narrative you can for example in 2019 post balakot the way the narrative got completely pakistan ko ghar mein ghus kar mara the prime minister said it in a rally in ahmedabad but within minutes it was in every whatsapp group with pictures photographs of the prime minister as some kind of a superhero now that is very very powerful because you're getting it on your mobile so the other m is mobile you know the mobile and and data is now so cheap that is geo you can add another m mukesh ambani <laughs> you know mukesh bhai has made it even easier because content is now available virtually to everyone so cheap so i think that has completely transformed the way elections are fought earlier they used to be fought on the maidan you have a rally the other party has a rally uh, a mahal is built but today the election has completely transformed and there's another m there are various m's in my book but another m is muslims and the way in which the bjp in particular has made the muslim out to be the enemy at times is something we can discuss but broadly speaking all i'm saying is elections have become much more sophisticated professional and competitive look at what is happening today in hyderabad 
the entire BJP leadership is in Hyderabad for a Hyderabad municipal election because they want up, they don't want to leave any election, uh, you know, to the opposition. Now, this level of competitiveness has not been seen in Indian elections, and I think the machine, the media, and money play a very important role in it. And of course, there is Mr. Modi, who's a natural campaigner. You know, let's let's be honest; he's a terrific communicator. He understands what to say, when, where. He has that skill. And that is a very important skill to have in this media age. If you're not a good communicator today, it you are you face a huge disadvantage in an Indian election. Hmm. You just, of course, have summed up the entire micromanagement that goes into elections these days. On the other side is the business of predicting elections. And this year has been an interesting year with the US and the Bihar elections and the fact that election forecasting, uh, there did exist a gap between the results and the polls. Yes. Why do you think that is? Look, you know, let's be honest. In a country as diverse as India, let's say in a Bihar, for example, with uh, 243 constituencies, uh, uh, where, you know, where uh, uh, mapping voter behavior, particularly in COVID times where, you know, it's difficult to reach out to every household uh, is not easy. Also, Indian elections, as they get, get, you know, with this micromanagement, they become competitive at the local level. There's not just the main two candidates. There may be an independent candidate, a fourth party or a third party, which is also competing. How does a pollster map all that in a manner where he can definitively say this is going to happen? Very difficult. In fact, America is easier, relatively easier, because America has a steady voting pattern. In India, voting patterns change all the time. Anti-incumbency, throwing out of government, throwing out of MLAs is much more frequent in India than it is in most other parts of the world. In America, you know, actually the election is fought in only about eight or ten states. 20 states are Republican, 20 states are Democrats, year after year. It's 10 states which decide, the so-called swing states. In India, every state is a swing state. In, 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 in India, every district is a, a, a swing district. So, you see, then to predict it is very difficult. Part of it is for television tamasha. You know, the day before in election, we say exit poll, create a tamasha, get... So, I think, I think we... And also, I think we need to be much more rigorous in our data collection. Having said that, uh, let me uh, explain Bihar, for example. In Bihar, what did we get wrong? We miscalculated women voters. Our pollster put 31%, polled only 31% women. Now, actually, 50% women approximately voted. In fact, according to some figures, 4% more women have voted than men. Uh, now, how do you then calculate that X factor, which is the women voter? And maybe that's where we got it wrong. I think we have to get more rigorous with our data collection. And, uh, you know, I don't think at the end of the day, polls should be taken as seriously as we as we do. They can give you a general trend, but predicting numbers in India is very difficult, very difficult. Hmm. Um, you just you just brought up COVID-19 uh, and how perhaps that that played a part in the data collection. And I well understand hmm. that. Uh, how do you think this pandemic, with all the disruptions and the changes that it has brought, the economic disruption, the social disruption, how is it going to change politics in India? Look, uh, you know, it didn't stop people from attending Tejasvi Yadav's rally. These, this is an amazing country. There is everybody <laughs> saying, Kid, please don't have large gatherings, please maintain social distancing. But at Tejasvi's rallies, there were thousands and thousands of people, many of them not without masks, no social distancing. Look, I don't think a pandemic can completely transform the way elections are fought in this country. And the pandemic won't last forever also. But I think what it has done is shown the importance of this micromanagement. Because parties that are able to use technology better, that are able to, in a sense, connect through technology, whether virtually like we are speaking or uh, through WhatsApp or through various other social media platforms. You don't need the door-to-door -door campaigning. You see, previous elections, you had to go door-to-door. Har darwaze par jaakar aapko vote mangna hai. That is increasingly now being replaced by technology. 
So I think in a pandemic world, we are all realizing, you know, how technology plays a much greater role today, Sunaina, in our lives in general, and will therefore play a greater role even in politics, in in mapping voter behavior. Uh, and and I think that uh, is 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 what the pandemic has taught us that you cannot ignore technology today as a real weapon at election time. It can, in a way, give you a cutting edge advantage. So parties which are more uh, technologically savvy will be able to organize themselves much better uh, at the booth level. In you see, elections are fought in India at the booth level. This is what people don't realize that. You know, you can make all the speeches you want. It's at the booth level. Now, if you organize your booth committees, that's when you win an election or lose. The BJP is much better than the Congress in that. And they've really excelled in their booth management techniques, as have some regional parties. And I think that is something which will remain, whether it's a pandemic or not a pandemic. Okay. And while we are future forecasting, uh, we must talk about um, we must talk about the media actually, and of course the me the role of media in shaping and influencing elections. We've talked about it in this discussion. You have uh, explored it at length in your book. If you were to look at the state of media now, currently, uh, w do you think we are at some sort of inflection point? What happens ahead to Indian media? Now you are asking me a question which which gives me sleepless nights. You know, I, I have been a journalist since 1988. So what is that now? 32 years. And, uh, you know, in these 32 years, uh, I have seen a dramatic transformation in the media. The media has become, in a way, uh, a player much more than it was. You know, earlier we were spectators. We were watching. You know, we used to be the observers. Now we are actually part of the game. And we are used, we are manipulated, and we allow ourselves to get manipulated. You know, the media management of the Modi machine is something that gives them a big advantage. The headline management, they know how, which headline to spin in what way, and the media is more than willing to be part of the process. I think the media, because, see, the media today, its business model is collapsing. So they are more and more dependent on government, government for advertising, government for support, government for patronage. And this is particularly true of television. And therefore, the media is unwilling, the mainstream media is unwilling to challenge governments beyond a point, both at the state and national level. So if you go in the state today, the Bengali uh, newspapers and channels will continuously back Mamta. If you see it in Delhi at a national level, a majority of them will back Mr. Modi and the BJP. As a result, it's not a level playing field. You see, my worry for Indian democracy and in election is election must be fought as a level playing field. Both sides must have equal chance. What is happening is the media is invisibilizing the opposition. I'm not giving the opposition any great credit. In my book also, I say Rahul Gandhi has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And as long as Rahul Gandhi is there, it becomes easier for Mr. Modi. But, but he has a point when he says that the media is unfair to me. And they are. Let's be very clear. The media has been heavily biased towards the BJP in, in the last six years. We haven't asked the kind of tough questions that we used to ask a Manmohan Singh or the previous government. Because I think the BJP has been much more clever and artful in controlling the media narrative. And we in the media have to ask ourselves, how are we going to become uh, what we were meant to be, which is to question governments? So I think the media crisis is a deeper crisis. It goes beyond elections. There's a deeper crisis of credibility facing the Indian media today. Absolutely. And amongst the things that, that are keeping you up at night, uh, I'm imagining um, one of the things would be, would perhaps be the second term of this government. Um, or in fact, I would like to ask you about it uh, because you have looked at Mr. Modi's public image uh, in the 2014 book as a challenger in the 2019 book as an incumbent who rides a huge wave of popularity. Mm -hmm. How do you see it now in the second term, one year into it, more than a year? You know, I think Modi is now a cult figure. <laughs> and the big change between 2019 and now is the beard has gone even longer. He looks like a rishi, like one of those old sages, like Rabindranath Tagore or someone. So I think Mr. Modi is no longer seen by his supporters in particular as an ordinary politician. He's seen as a as a media as the leader of a politico religious cult, and I think that means that 
it's very difficult even even if his government makes a mistake or or does you know or, or the economy goes into a tailspin people still say nahi nahi lekin modi ji kuch to kar lenge so he has to his credit built a lot of trust which is his strength on the negative side it has also meant that we are we have resorted to hero worship with the result that no questions are asked you know it's almost and and that is anti democratic in my view in my view when a prime minister doesn't hold a press conference doesn't take questions uh that's anti democratic on the other hand the fact that the prime minister has such high levels of trust give you hope that you know maybe he can ride on that trust to bring genuine change in the country now so it's a mixed record to my mind mr modi is a mixed record uh unfortunately today society is polarized main kuch achhi baat modi ji ke bare mein kahunga to log kahenge are tu bhi big gaya you have become a bhag if i say something negative about mr modi people will say oh you are always anti modi you see society has got divided we've got polarized and the cult of modi has increased these divisions even further in our society that is what worries me we need much more inclusion we need much more institutional challenges to a single leader we don't want to be a single leader single party democracy surely we should be a multi party multi individual vibrant democracy that is the strength of india right and also of the indian electorate for that matter and in your book uh, you have talked quite a lot about uh, the rise of the middle class in india and how that coincides with the rise of bjp so according to you what do elections tell us about a changing india that's one and also as a reporter as a news analyst how do you even look at the indian electorate the indian voter with all the diversity that that brings you know the first question is a fascinating one and i had a big debate with the late arun jetli a few years ago on this and he made a very interesting observation his observation was that as india becomes to his mind more middle class or more and more indians aspire to be middle class it will change the politics of india forever how by making people vote for parties that work on delivery systems you know the better delivery systems you provide or at least give the impression that you are making an effort to provide those delivery system beat health beat education beat cleaner air people will start voting for them i still haven't seen that happen fully but i can see some signs that maybe as a younger india uh, sort of focuses on as we've seen in the last year on public health or a that while north india in particular is still caught in caste and uh, the caste trap in in sort of regional identities religious identities there is a growing urban middle class which is more demanding of our politicians in terms of expecting better public utilities and i do see that becoming an issue in indian elections over the years it may not happen overnight but it is going to slowly start happening the expectations of the voters hopefully will start increasing as their income levels improve so that's one big change this middle class ification in a way of india so you had to a, you had a second of, question sorry no i uh, forgot to say my second question was how do you as a news analyst deal uh, you know sort of look at the indian electorate hmm. considering there is no one indian electorate in a diverse country like ours you know i i i i must confess that uh, i fear that the indian electorate is at the end of the day still taken for a ride you know uh, politicians come before the elections make all kinds of promises uh, many of them remain unfulfilled and i think that there is a growing disjunction between our citizens or, or us as citizens and our leadership you know they do not they do not uh, in a way recognize the citizen as much as they should Uh, they get disconnected from the citizen and that worries me you know people are electing in this election also 2019 people didn't elect often an mp they were electing modi or bjp in fact according to the cs csds post poll survey one in every three voters who voted for the bjp did not even know the name of the candidate voted for mr modi right so you see you are creating in a way the basis for a presidential style system almost where you are now electing not a party not even a party actually but an individual and as an observer that worries me because then the mla mp's accountability becomes much less 
I believe we should have a system where our MPs, MLAs, councillors are much more accountable. कि पांच साल में किया क्या आपने? कितने uh, you know uh, कितने uh, you know how many roads did you build? How many uh, uh, trees did you plant? How many hospitals did you uh, uh, sort of uh, help create? So I think I think that is the worry as an observer that our electorate is still not being given is still not in a position to hold our leaders accountable enough. That worries me. Right, and to just uh, go back to the point that you made about the middle class and also about delivery of systems in a way, and how perhaps that is something that they will demand. You also looked at in your book about the whole marketing of welfareism that took place um, in the last election, and of course uh, that also followed on the heels of the whole development plank and the promises of that. Do you think that will shift at all this year, or is that something that has to still be an important part of governance and also election campaigning? You know, let's be it's honest, Sunil. We are still a poor country, where we, where uh, getting a, a a a gas cylinder or getting a toilet or getting a bank account open matter. And I think mm -hmm. Mr. Modi has that has been Mr. Modi's strength. He re realized that. He realized that if I can improve, improve on my last mile delivery systems, maybe provide a village with a toilet, maybe provide a, 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 a family with a bank account, maybe ensure that the woman in the house gets a, a, a gas cylinder, you know, through Ujwala. If I can ensure that the pilferages in the system are minimal and those who need it through technology, using technology, using Aadhaar, I can ensure the so-called jam tri trinity. Jandhan, Aadhaar, Mobile. Ensure that those who need these utilities get them. That form of welfareism will reward me. So I think, I think welfareism has to exist. Mr. Modi has been cleverer in marketing it, yes, but he has also been more effective in delivering some of those utilities. So I think you know we talk about big ticket reforms to grow at seven, eight, ten percent. Obviously, we need that. But I think elections are not won on big ticket reforms as much as they are won on effective welfare delivery system. You know, BJP started the labharthis, the beneficiaries, who mm -hmm. were, and they had a full list of all the people who had got the benefit of the uh, of the Ujwala system. And then you are ringing them up and saying, "Remember, we have given you this. Now vote, must give." Now that level of micromanagement, linking it to welfareism. I mean, any any marketing company would love it. You know, mm -hmm. this is. I, I often say, you know, let's be honest. That's what uh, corporates do. So BJP is not just a political party anymore. It's a full-fledged business enterprise almost, where marketing is an important element. But you can't win an election only because of marketing. You have to also deliver. Hmm. Okay, I am being told that we have just two minutes left, and I felt that I wanted to ask you so much more. Uh, but I, I think. It Good if we can wrap up this discussion by bringing it back to literature and books. And I want to ask you if you've been able to use the lockdown time to catch up with your reading. What are you reading? And also, are you going to be writing another book soon? You know, I have used this lockdown time to rest. Uh, <laughs> you know, to to give my body a rest in a way. Uh, I have, you know, I've been reading a variety of books. I've been doing a lot of Netflixing. I must confess. When Netflix bought the guy, I discovered Netflix only this year and Amazon. So, but I, I, you know, I read all kinds of books. I, I just finished reading a book on cricket by Ram Gua. Uh, yeah, before that, uh, I was reading a, a, a book on a completely uh, a, a different subject, which was Obama's book on on his uh, uh, life. So, uh, you know, I, 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 whatever comes to me, I pick it up. I, I read it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've used the lockdown time more to to thoda rest. 2019 was a very tough year, and I had planned 2020 as a year of a sabbatical. Uh, so I couldn't get the sabbatical, but I've rested. My wife is right. Sagrika is writing a book uh, at the moment. So in one family, you can only have one person writing a book at one time because a book is a very exhausting exercise. It takes a lot out of you emotionally. You know, in the night you get up, you think, "Are yes." Should I add this? Should I not have this? After you finish writing the book, I, you say, "Oh shit! Why didn't I include this? Could I have written that better?" So I think a book takes a lot of it drains you out. So I've uh, I have no plans, but I'm thinking of writing a book on television, but oh. not but a fiction book where the anchor gets murdered. 
Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> and then through through the murder of an anchor, we decide we look at the decline of TV. So the decline, the death of a newsroom through the murder of a TV anchor. So ye please write mur- this book. <laughs> so I so the idea is to is to sort of give a sense of what happens inside a TV newsroom and who killed the anchor is the uh, <laughs> is the is the suspense. So that may be one day. but i need a break you see it's very difficult to do write a book when you are doing tv because there's too much of noise around you so if i can get 3 months off go to goa sit by the beach i think i can write that book but i don't know when that will happen okay i hope that happens thank you rajdeep sir this i it was an absolute pleasure to hear from thank you, you. Sumera. and thank we you. can wait for your next book thank you so much and uh, i i wish everyone at the orange city literature festival the very best do pick up the book it's now also in paperback with a new afterword so and it's coming out in hindi also i believe on monday so there's a there's a lot to look forward to that's excellent thank you to the orange city literature festival for organizing Thanks, this Lena. thing us thank you to the audience thank and you. everyone have a wonderful evening it's over to you neha thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest, I sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Thank you. Lastly, spe- special th- thanks to SJ Knowledge Foundation, and see you tomorrow in the OCLS 2020 with more learning. So be there and show your love to literature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Twenty years of existence. Two universities. Twenty-three educational institutes. Offering a hundred and thirty-seven courses. Rising group of institutions. A vision beyond. Where is he?